Before we go ahead and really get started, just a quick note on logistics for today's webinar. In case you had some members of your team who aren't able to make it or you wanted to share this with others, we will be recording the session. So we'll send out a recording early next week to everybody who registered. So feel free to share that recording with anybody or let us know if you have any other questions. And I think, Mike, it's 10.03. We can go ahead and get started. So I'll go ahead and kick it off. Thank you, everybody, for joining another IntentWise Connect webinar. We are so excited to have you all with us today to discuss how to bring your brand to LATAM and how to start selling one of the fastest growing e-commerce markets. Today, our agenda is going to cover these following things. What will you learn? The opportunity in LATAM, we're going to spend a lot of time reviewing the metrics and the size of the opportunity in Latin America, your options for selling into these markets, and Mexico and Brazil specific challenges that you might run into. So I'm happy to introduce our guest today is Mike Begg from AMZ Advisors. Mike, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Mike. I'm the CEO of AMZ Advisors. Uh, I've been running AMZ Advisors for eight years now. Uh, we help brands expand globally from the US uh, to Europe and vice versa. And yeah, we've helped over 300 brands grow on the Amazon platform. So that's very high level. I also run a company called Go Avance, which helps brands expand into Latin America and deal with a lot of the challenges there. And that's mainly what we're gonna be talking about today. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll quickly introduce myself and IntentWise as well. I'm the head of growth here at IntentWise. If you haven't heard of IntentWise or you're not exactly sure what we do, we offer a suite of software applications for brands and agencies who sell on marketplaces like Amazon, Walmart, Instacart, and Critio. We have three core applications. One is our IntentWise Ad Optimizer, which helps you use AI and rules-based automation to manage your bids across um, your advertising on Amazon and Walmart. We have IntentWise Analytics Cloud, which is an automated reporting solution for marketplaces like Amazon and Walmart, helping you to connect to all of the APIs and ingest and enrich and visualize all of this data that marketplaces are sharing with you. And then lastly, we have IntentWise Explore, which is our uh, solution built on top of Amazon Marketing Cloud, which allows you to extract insights and visualize uh, rec reports and queries from AMC without needing to write SQL yourself. So if you're interested in learning more about IntentWise or our suite of applications, feel free to reach out. My email is here on the screen, or you can go to intentwise.com slash meetings to book a time with us. And with that, Mike, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you for the bulk of today's presentation. Awesome. Thank you for that, Ryan. I'll also add that we've been a partner of IntentWise for more than two years and love working with the tool. So I would highly recommend it to anyone looking uh, for some new advertising software. Awesome. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I touched briefly on my companies, uh, AMZ Advisors. We are the global expansion partner for brands around the globe. We specialize in taking brands from doing 1 million uh, in a marketplace to doing over 10 million a, a month in sales. Uh, and we're an Amazon advanced partner, meaning that we are in the top 5% of uh, advertisers on the Amazon platform. Go Avance is our business in Latin America. Uh, what we do with Go Avance is that we help brands from Europe, from North America, from Asia that are looking to get into Latin America. And we help them scale their sales up in Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. Uh, as we're going to see today, there's a variety of challenges that come for foreign brands when expanding to Latin America, and that's really what we're tackling with Go Advance. So first of all, why should you listen to me, a gringo, talking about Latin America? Well, for, I've lived in Mexico for over six years. Uh, I'm married to a Mexican. Uh, I have a lot of experience dealing in Mexican business culture and dealing with Mexican consumers. Also living in Latin America, uh, I have experience as a consumer buying from the platforms. And we'll touch more on this throughout the presentation, but the consumer experience in Latin America uh, from an e-commerce standpoint, especially with Amazon and Mercado Libre, are hurting for foreign brands. Foreign brands' current uh, selling options between NARF and global selling through Mercado Libre are terrible options for the end consumer. And we're going to talk about why that is and honestly why it will actually uh, improve your conversion rates if you were doing things in a different manner. To kind of start this conversation off, why should you even care about selling in Latin America? Well, we're going to do a little, little comparison here. It's not entirely apples to apples because the data is not as clear uh, around some of the Latin American marketplaces. But uh, 2022 sales in UK Amazon was about 30.1 billion US dollars. In Germany, we're looking at about 33.6 billion US dollars. And in Japan, it was about 24.39 billion US dollars. Those are all huge amounts. That's a lot of, a lot of sales coming through one platform. Uh, these retail sales, excuse me. 
Uh, in Latin America, the total e-commerce marketplace is estimated between 140 billion and 350 billion. Now, that also is a, quite a big range. Uh, the reason for that, as I said before, is that the data in Latin America is not as reliable. Uh, America's intelligent, America's marketing intelligence is uh, one of the companies we, we rely on a lot for our market data. And even they reference multiple businesses that have extremely varying different ranges uh, or multiple surveys that have extremely high ranging uh, sales estimates, uh, some estimating Latin American sales at 50, uh, at 150 billion, others estimating it at 450 billion. So it's a pretty wide range and that's a little bit confusing, but either way, you're looking at a pretty substantial size, even at 150 billion. Yeah, safe to say it's, it's not a market that should be ignored. No, not at all. And I think uh, this was actually from, I believe it was Goldman Sachs. Uh, the global wealth distribution table uh, of how things have changed uh, around the world in 2022. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of concerns about the economic conditions. Inflation has been on the top of everyone's mind and a lot of different changes. Uh, I'm going to highlight specifically the uh, change in wealth per adult. So if we look around the world, uh, Africa, Asia, China, Europe, India, uh, and North America all saw declines in wealth per adult. The area where you saw the largest increase is Latin America. Latin America is growing quickly. The middle class is expanding quickly, and there's a lot of demand for foreign goods. So there's a really good opportunity for brands that are able to get in there and take advantage of a lot of this new disposable income that is coming into Latin America. This uh, data was actually provided by IntentWise uh, and helps us uh, summarize our point from the selling side on why you should focus on you know, Mexico and other marketplaces. Uh, IntentWise's own data on the Mexican marketplace shows some really interesting comparisons when you're looking at the US. Uh, from 2022 to 2023 so far, we've actually seen overall ROAS improve in Mexico, which is a crazy concept. Uh, sellers are actually doing better on the advertising side instead of getting worse. Uh, CPCs have gone down, uh, or sorry, have gone up a little bit, but the really unique point to me is the average transaction value has gone up by 50% over the course of a year. So more and more people are starting to purchase more items online. They're willing to pay more. And when you look at the average transaction value compared to the U S it's not that far off. So pricing, uh, difference or uh, pricing variance between the countries is really not that different. I think that's been a big concern for a lot of sellers in the past is that I'm not going to be able to sell my product for as much in Mexico. That's not true. This is the breakdown in sales between Latin American countries. And this will be highlighted a lot through our, our main conversation today. Brazil and Mexico are the two largest marketplaces in Latin America. It's over 50% of the e-commerce sales. So over 50% of that 150 to $350 billion is happening in two countries. So you as a seller would be taking advantage of focusing on these two countries would probably get the best results for you. The other countries do have opportunities. Colombia, Argentina, Chile, per Peru all have uh, increasing middle class that are looking to buy more products online. However, the market size is pretty much dwarfed by Brazil and Mexico when it comes to figuring out where you want to start in Latin America. This was also a great piece of data that was provided uh, by IntentWise to, to help us illustrate our point. And uh, this is from SimilarWeb, Amazon's web traffic growth between 2022 and 2023. Uh, Mexico saw about 125% growth uh, in, in website visitors on Amazon. And Brazil saw about 200% growth over the course of a year. So more and more people are going to these platforms to look for products. More and more people are going to shop from there. It's just another justification of why you should be focusing on these platforms or focusing on these marketplaces. Specifically, diving in a little bit more into the countries, uh, Mexico is LATAM's second largest marketplace, which I've already talked about. 57% uh, of e-commerce shoppers buy cross-border. So because of proximity to the US and the lack of product selection in Mexico, most Mexican consumers are forced to shop in the US or from e-commerce platforms in the US and have the product imported into Mexico. That comes with a variety of changes and a, there's a lot of negatives to that that I'm going to cover in a little bit. But uh, the consumers are already looking for US goods, which is the thing to consider here. Uh, overall, year-over-year uh, -year growth in 2022 was 18% in Mexico, making it one of the still one of the fastest growing marketplaces uh, worldwide. And the expected uh, compound annual growth rate of Mexico between 2022 
in 2027 is 16.8%, which means that this market is just going to continue to grow rapidly. Uh, and it's a really, uh, I can't highlight enough how much this data is telling me you should be in Latin America. Uh, comparing to the share of e-commerce uh, sales to retail sales, Mexico and Brazil are just outside the top 10. Uh, but if you're looking at how this compares, 11.3% of all uh, retail sales are happening in e-commerce in Mexico. In the U.S., it's only 16.1%. So Mexico is not that far behind when it comes to making most of their uh, or making a, a substantial amount of their e-commerce sales online. Uh, and like I said, it's just outside top 10. Brazil, 10.7 is not that far behind. So again, a lot more people are shopping on e-commerce. It's pretty comparable as a percentage of the population to what you're seeing or a percentage of the uh, retail sales happening as to what we're seeing in the US uh, and some of the European markets. Brazil is Latin America's largest e-commerce market. It was also the second fastest e-commerce uh, growing market globally in 2021. I think it was uh, number two or three in 2022. I need to check on that. Uh, but there are over 130 million e-commerce shoppers in Brazil. Uh, similar to what I mentioned in Mexico, it is growing fast. The expected uh, compound annual growth rate of e-commerce sales in Me in Brazil is 17% between 2023 and 2026. So again, we're expected to continue to see substantial growth of e-commerce sales in the Brazilian marketplace. Brazil was number four in uh, 2022 uh, retail e-commerce uh, sales growth. Uh, so it was number two in uh, 2021, number four in 2022. So it's still in the top five. Uh, and these, the Brazilian market is substantially larger than the Philippine and the Indonesian market when you think about that. So the growth of seeing 22%, uh, 18% the year before that, it's substantially growing and it's going to keep growing faster. You also see Mexico makes this list at 18% at number nine, growing faster than the U.S. is uh, from an e-commerce standpoint. This, this is another uh, chart that's just highlighting why you should focus on getting your brand into some of these Latin American markets. Uh, foreign brand preference, as measured in Brazil, 47% of consumers want to buy foreign brands over domestic brands. This same type of concept exists in Mexico. The term is called malanchismo. Malanchismo essentially means that they think domestic made goods in Mexico are not of the same quality as foreign goods. So there's a preference to buy foreign goods in Mexico as well. It's obviously not as high as this, but in general, the concept exists here as well in Mexico. So there are a lot of consumers that are looking for foreign goods. Uh, there's a lack of foreign goods in these markets. So again, hammering this point home, if you are a foreign brand from the US, Europe, uh, Asia, wherever, getting your brand into uh, Latin America, there's going to be a lot more demand for it, especially highlighting that you're a foreign brand might actually benefit you from the e-commerce sales standpoint. Now, uh, getting into how you can actually sell in Latin America, there's essentially three different options. Uh, one being drop shipping or the equivalent of drop shipping would be NARF or global selling, uh, North American remote fulfillment or global selling from Mercado Libre. Uh, you could also set up a local uh, subsidiary or partner with a distributor in the marketplace to get your sales. To cover all of these and some of the benefits and uh, the pros and cons of them, uh, drop shipping from a 3PL or your own warehouse, the main pro is that if it's coming from your own warehouse, you don't need a new warehouse. It makes your inventory management simpler. There's no uh, cross-border upfront costs when you're importing. So for example, bringing products into to Mexico, you're going to have to pay the, the value add tax when the product comes in. Uh, you also don't need to deal with any fiscal liabilities in Mexico by setting up a tax ID and any of those things. The cons are that your products are not going to convert as well. Because of the product coming from another country, there's going to be tariffs, there's going to be other fees uh, and import costs that the end consumer is going to have to pay. So for example, when I buy a product on Amazon that's being uh, in Mexico and it says importacion from the US, there are additional fees there. And I know that that means there's additional fees there. So for, I bought a uh, computer monitor uh, for one of my uh, team members and I thought I got a great deal on it on Black Friday, $120 uh, coming from the US. I was like, oh, great. The product arrived and I had another import tax bill for $100. So I almost paid <laughs> the same price. Uh, and any savings I got from buying it on Black Friday was wiped out by that. And that's what most sellers don't realize is that the end consumer, when you're doing NARF, when you're doing global selling, when you're doing drop shipping from your own warehouse or cross-border, has additional costs that you aren't aware of. 
Plus, and I know you're going to get into this, it's the wait times too, um, right? You know, not having the prime shipping and being able to track exactly when that's going to arrive. It could sit in customs for a long time if it's being imported into a new country, right? Of course. And, and the wait times are, are very long. Uh, it could take anywhere from one to two weeks at some points to get products across the border. Uh, we recently had an issue with a client that made a misspelling on our invoice, uh, sending it in. So the product got caught at the border. We had to send it back to the US. They have to repackage it or they have to relabel it, send it back to us again. So there's a lot of things that really need to be on point to make sure that there's no problems when you're actually bringing the product through customs. Uh, obviously working with, uh, you know, for individual packages, working with like DHL, FedEx, UPS, something like that can help. But one tip is never send a product by USPS. USPS, when it hits Mexico, arrives at a company called Correos de Mexico. Correos de Mexico is like USPS, but like a thousand times worse. Uh, your stuff is never going to arrive if it comes through uh, Correos de Mexico. So you're also going to get complaints from consumers. Uh, they're going to ask for refunds, returns. The product's going to get lost. There's a whole bunch of other issues here. And the other thing to consider is that you have less market share possibilities. Uh, certain products are restricted from being in uh, sold cross border. Certain uh, products are not a, eligible for the NARF and the, the global selling program. And you have higher fees as well because NARF uh, for Amazon, global selling for Mercado Libre, they charge more to actually ship the product cross border than you would pay for a local FBA fee or a local fulfillment fee having a warehouse in country. Makes sense. Uh, I've touched on a lot of these. The, the NARF and Mercado Libre uh, global selling programs are similar. Uh, some of the other benefits are that you don't need a, a business entity. Um, like I said, some of the product selections you can bring are, are limited. Certain products are restricted. Uh, returns are a specifically big challenge with these two programs and that the seller needs to bring the product back to the country if they ask for a return. So uh, not only do you need to provide a shipping label, you're also going to provide a international shipping label, which is going to have its own costs. Uh, you're probably going to lose, spend more money on fees and other challenges. So, uh, it, it's not worth it. Uh, Amazon's referral fees specifically are also higher for, uh, for the NARF program. Uh, one example is that a $40 sale is going to have a $15 fee on it. So that's substantially higher than you would pay on a normal Amazon referral fee. The other option is opening a business in the market. So uh, this is a viable option for a lot of uh, larger companies that maybe have the money uh, to invest in, in opening operations in, in Mexico, in Brazil, wherever it may be. Uh, but you are going to run into other challenges here, uh, other challenges going this route. Uh, legal compliance in the home and uh, target markets are going to be completely 100% taken care of. You're not going to have to worry about tax liabilities uh, from, uh, you know, kind of going through loopholes with the, the NARF program uh, or drop shipping from your own warehouse. Uh, there's no going to be any end uh, importer tariff fees on the end consumer. You will be paying those yourself as the local subsidiary once the product comes across. So it, it simplifies a lot of that. Uh, it also allows you to have better pricing uh, since you're not dealing with a lot of the fees of, uh, of the NARF program. Uh, you can actually provide better pricing to the end consumer, and you can actually improve the end customer uh, experience. The cons of having a local subsidy uh, subsidiary is that the business formation time can be substantial. So when we started our business in Mexico, uh, as foreigners, it took about four months just to get the business documents done. It took about another three months to get the business filed. Uh, or no, sorry, it took about another four weeks to get the business filed. And then it took about another two months to get a tax ID. All of that substantial time, and it's a substantial investment in time to really get it up and running, uh, which is one of the big cons of opening a local subsidiary. That's in Mexico. Brazil is even worse. You can expect 12 to 18 months to be able to open a business in Brazil. Wow. And Mike, I'm assuming throughout this process, a lot of these documents are going to be in the local language too, right? So having some you know capability internally of being able to complete these complicated documents in Spanish or Portuguese is also a challenge, right? <laughs> Yes, it is a challenge. Uh, so you obviously need to have the right legal advisors to make sure that your contracts are correct. Uh, you need to make sure that you have the right understanding of the legal system because uh, the Mexican and Brazilian and, and Latin American legal systems are not based on the same legal system as the U.S. Uh, the U.S. comes from common law, uh, which is related to the U.K., the legal systems in Latin America are completely different, and that's going to be a whole variety of different challenges. Making sure you have the right understanding of what the agreements say is going to be a massive, massive uh, 
you know, focus to make sure you're not making any mistakes on a contract you sign. Um, other cons here, logistics, you're going to have to deal with logistics in the local market, uh, your last mile fulfillment, your 3PLs, uh, whatever options you're going to use to actually get the product to the end consumer. Uh, customer service is going to be in a different language, which is a similar challenge to what we were talking about with contracts. Uh, if you don't have a customer service agent that speaks those languages, you're going to need to hire one. And then finally, at the end of the day, you have a lot of fiscal responsibility for making sure all the filings are done. Um, I can say from my own experience, again, here in Mexico, working with the Hacienda, uh, which is SAT, uh, the name of the IRS in Mexico, is not fun. Uh, there's a lot of things you need to do in person. Um, so if you are a foreigner uh, business owner looking to open a business in Mexico, expect to be coming to visit to Mexico frequently to do a lot of your filings, a lot of your contract signings, and a lot of the other uh, legal aspects that you're going to be dealing with. Hopefully you like Mexico. The other option is working with a distributor. Uh, again, this gives you legal compliance in the home and target markets. It does give you better pricing control because you're not dealing with the fees from, from NARF and, and global selling. Uh, it does improve the customer experience and it does have the potential to get your product to other distrib distribution channels. So for example, uh, you might be focused on uh, Mercado Libre and uh, Amazon because those are you know, two of the biggest marketplaces. But maybe another seller wants to sell on Coppel or Liverpool or uh, even TikTok or social media, whatever it may be. So it has the potential for expanding the number of resellers and increasing the reach of your brand. The challenge with working in with a distributor is no different than working with a distributor in the U.S. You have a lack of control over uh, the pricing uh, unless you have a map agreement, uh, which, again, that's a legal challenge between countries. So a map agreement is not going to be enforceable in Mexico or Brazil. Uh, the contract challenges are going to run. Again, you're going to have to have them translated. You're going to have to make sure everything makes sense. Uh, dealing with customer service and brand representation. Uh, as a foreign brand, working with a distributor in another country, cultural differences between the countries are going to impact the way that your brand is represented and the, the way that your customer service is handled. So working with a distributor sometimes has the potential to affect both of those, which could affect your brand image. Uh, and finally, like I said, work culture differences and, and map enforcement. It's not going to happen in Mexico. Uh, so those are your three options for really getting into to Latin America. Diving a little bit more into Mexico specifically, uh, the two biggest marketplaces are Mercado Libre and Amazon. Uh, about 50, over 50% 50 of shoppers uh, shop on both of those platforms. Uh, and then the other platforms beyond that are Walmart, Liverpool, Coppel, AliExpress, Sam's Club, Wish, Costco, and, and Home Depot. So again, talking about where am I going to get the, the majority of my return, focusing on the top two uh, on Mercado Libre and Amazon. Like I said, focusing on the top two marketplaces between Brazil and Mexico. It's going to get you the best return uh, in the shortest amount of time for selling on those. A lot of these other marketplaces will be great additions, but the main focus should be getting up and running on Mercado Libre and Amazon. We've talked a lot about this already, but I'm going to cover it a little bit more on some of the challenges specifically in Mexico. Uh, the legal owners of the inventory are registered, uh, have to be registered with the, uh, have to have an RFC. So for example, you could work with a warehouse in Mexico to import your product. Uh, they will have to use their own RFC. Legally, they own your inventory at that point. So you better hope you can trust them. You better hope that they're not doing anything uh, illegal or something that might cause problems for you in the future because all of your inventory is at risk. Uh, also opening a business, if you're not going to do it on your own uh, or if you're going to go that route, you're going to need a uh, Mexican partner. So you're going to need a business partner in Mexico as a Mexican national. Uh, and you're going to need a legal representative as well. So you're going to also need a Mexican lawyer to help uh, with the, the business opening. Uh, you're going to have to register with the Office of Foreign Investment, uh, which is an, another process. Uh, the apostille documents, your uh, birth certificate, your passport, uh, and a few other documents. I forgot exactly what they were at this point. They all need to be notarized and apostilled in the U.S. and then sent down to Mexico. And then finally, you're going to actually have to come to Mexico to finalize the signing. So as I said, I hope you like Mexico. Um you also have to have proof of tax payment abroad. So you have to prove that you are a, ta a registered taxpayer in another country and you need to have a commissary position, uh, which is essentially like uh, an overseer of your company. It's like a third party objective person uh, to be responsible for making sure that you are not breaking any laws. Uh, so that's another role that you're gonna need to find and find something you trust to be able to do that role in Mexico specifically. 
Uh, timeline, as I mentioned, four more weeks for formation, uh, five plus months for tax registration, two to six weeks for a bank account. Banking in Mexico is also a nightmare. So, uh, you know, we, we just had to send some uh, money to our clients and we have to go to the bank in person to actually send the money. So uh, keep that in mind that if you are going to work remotely and not be coming down to Mexico to make these transfers, someone, uh, some, some employee, your partner, whoever is going to need to have the ability to go to the bank and have the authorization to go to the bank to actually send that money, which is a whole nother risk. Uh, taxes, you have a 16% value add tax when products coming in, uh, it's value add. So it's essentially equivalent to a sales tax is passed through, <clears throat> excuse me, to the end consumer. Uh, the way pricing works in Mexico is that the value add tax is baked into the final price. So pretty much if you've been to Mexico before, anytime you buy something, it ends in, you know, a hundred peso or 200 peso that's including the value add tax that's already in there. So the real price on a hundred peso is what? uh like 88 peso or something uh is the actual price of the good and then that difference is the value add tax that's being added um additional taxes are isr uh mercado libre and amazon will retain isr or income tax if you do not have an rfc so as i mentioned you could work with a warehouse down here to send inventory but if you don't have your own rfc to start selling on the amazon platform or mercado libre platform Amazon and Mercado Libre are both going to hold about 20% of your total sales uh, to pay ISR. So um, going through the right process and having your own RFC can drop that ISR tax uh, down substantially. It can be anywhere between one and 7%. So you're looking at losing 20% of your income uh, to only going down to 7%. So that's another reason to, to really go that route. With NARF and global selling, there are no local tax burdens, meaning that the end consumer is the one that's actually dealing with the local tax burdens. You as a foreign business does not do not have to worry about VAT, uh, VAT remittance, import taxes. The end consumer is dealing with that, which is why the end consumer frequently ends up with bills for uh, fees to get the product released to them when, they, when it actually arrives, which is adding substantial cost to the order. Uh, VAT is paid beforehand when you bring the product into the country. Uh, so you're able to reclaim that VAT based on the sales of the products. So it's essentially offset. It's passed through by the consumer. It's not really a cost to the business at the end of the day, but there is an upfront cost that you need to pay when you're bringing the product in. Uh, Cross-border logistics, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you need to have the importer record. The importer record needs to have an RFC. They need to have a legal business entity here. Uh, the great thing about Mexico is that the land border makes logistics much cheaper than sea freight. We'll see uh, how that's a little bit different in Brazil shortly, but having a land border uh, and having a highway system like we do in Mexico uh, makes it much easier to bring products from the U.S. into Mexico. Uh, import duties are a little bit crazy, uh, and they vary on a product uh, per product basis. So, for example, with textiles, with T-shirts or, or clothing, there are different tariffs based on the percentage of each fabric you use. So if you have 100% cotton versus 90% cotton, the tariff schedule is different. Uh, so that gets a little complicated. And we have a, we do have a free trade agreement with uh, Mexico, but I will say the free trade agreement benefits companies bringing products into the U.S. The benefit is not really uh, on foreign products coming into to Mexico uh, as much. Uh, Last mile delivery, uh, delivery. Um, you know, you can do marketplace fulfillment. Uh, Amazon has uh, FBA here. Mercado Libre also has Mercado Full, which is the equivalent of FBA. Uh, but Merc Mercado Full is invitation only. So uh, if you're not invited to the program, you can't get into it. Uh, that means that if you're going to sell on that platform, you either need to do multi-channel from Amazon or you need to do a 3PL. Um, 3PL solutions are pretty price competitive with FBA. Uh, you can hold all your inventory in, inventory in one place. Uh, there's generally no restrictions on the products you can have. And if the product is sellable, it goes back uh, on the shelf, similar to what you would see with FBA. Uh, the difference is being that FBA is not, uh, or the prime badge, I should say, is not like a requirement on Amazon, like for the, for the end consumer. If the end consumer can still get the product in two to three days or three to four days, they are still willing to purchase the product. It's not like the US where every product needs to be prime. Everything needs to be in the F in FBA. It needs, I need to know it arrives in next day or next two days, or I'm not going to buy it. Consumer shopping uh, preferences in Mexico are much different than that, that way. 
it's actually a benefit uh, to be able to use the 3PL instead of dealing with a lot of the headaches that come with, you know, Amazon's uh, processing times and the challenges around Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and the other uh, holiday periods. Mike, uh, before we get into Brazil, just uh -huh. to wrap it up, uh, we have a question here. So you talked a little bit about the timeline of getting started in Mexico. It's definitely going to take several months um, to accomplish all of the legal um, things that you need to do and also the team that you need to assemble there. Do you have an idea or a baseline of what the costs involved are over that time period? I know obviously it'll depend on exactly which route you take, but just in terms of like the basic legal protections and things that you need to get set up, what what, what are brands looking at in terms of costs? So for us, we, just for the business formation that we paid for, it was about $5,000. Uh, we had a, our being in Mexico and having a lot of contacts here. I had other connections that helped with a lot of the legal aspects, but you'd be expecting to pay another ten thousand dollars or more uh, on the formation. So you're looking at somewhere around fifteen thousand, uh, ten to fifteen thousand probably, to Minimum. get everything set up correctly. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, moving on to Brazil, Brazil has its own my rate of challenges that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, marketplaces in Brazil are a little bit different. Mercado Livre is the same as Mercado Libre. It's just as a vive in Portuguese. Uh, it is the largest e-commerce platform in Brazil. It has 139.5 million active users per year, uh, sorry, per month, and 34.45 billion dollars in sales for uh, 2022. So when we're looking at the numbers that we saw before for Amazon UK, Amazon Germany, uh, Mercado Libre in Brazil is bigger than all of the Amazon uh, European marketplaces individually. Uh, so it's bigger than the UK, it's bigger than Germany, it's bigger than France. Uh, just one one platform that is accounting for not even all the sales uh, in the marketplace. Um, Mercado Libre is different though, in that it is seller-based, not ASIN-based. And what I mean by that is that on Amazon, each individual product has its own merits. So you can sell one product and, or you can focus your efforts on one market, on marketing one product and you're going to get sales. You can focus your efforts on another and you're going to get sales. With Mercado Libre, you need to build up your seller reputation. So if you don't have a high seller reputation, your products are not going to have visibility. So it doesn't matter about how much marketing you do for each individual product if you don't have the seller reputation and the sales history. So you have to place a big focus on building up that reputation and as an expectation, it is going to take you a longer time to get started on Mercado Libre uh, while you build up that reputation. Um, the global selling program also has limits uh, to shipping into Brazil. So the NARF equivalent uh, for Mercado Libre, the product must be less than 50 USD. So if the product is over 50 USD, you can't use the Mercado Full program. If it's also in certain categories, you're not going to be able to, to use the Mercado Full program. Uh, so that is another thing to consider. Uh, and you also cannot get into Mercado Full or Mercado Full's uh, local fulfillment without the CNPJ, which is the tax registration. It's the same as the RFC in Mexico. Uh, and you also can't get into Amazon fulfillment in Mexico without an RFC. The second largest marketplace in Brazil is Lojas Americanas. And Lojas uh, has more than 1 billion visits to their website annually. 60% uh, of the sales are by third-party sellers. Uh, so... When we look at the, uh, I don't want to say the, I guess I would say the sophistication of sellers, there are much more sophisticated sellers in Brazil than there are in other Latin American marketplaces. The fact that they're generating, they have so much more exposure to shoppers, uh, that they have all these different marketplaces they can be selling on. The ability for Brazilian sellers or uh, Brazilian companies uh, to get more incremental sales out of their e-commerce. They have way more experience than that than a lot of other companies uh, in some of these other marketplaces. Um, the referral fees for Lojas are between 12 and 19%, depending on the products, which is fairly comparable to Amazon. Um, again, they have their own fulfillment network like Mercado Full for uh, Mercado Libre and Amazon uh, FBA. Again, you need a tax ID. Another unique aspect uh, is that with this platform, you cannot fulfill orders from outside the country, uh, except for some instances from China. So with Lojas Americanas, you can't drop ship from the US or from any other country. Uh, you actually have to be have the product uh, or the inventory in the country or within an export processing zone to be able to sell the product. Uh, you also have limited ad placements. So 
from the, the ability to create visibility for your brand is a little bit more challenging on the Los Americanos. Amazon is actually the third biggest platform in Brazil, so uh, which is probably surprising to a lot of people. But uh, it does not have many fulfillment centers at this point. I mean, they've opened more over the past year. Majority of fulfillment centers have been reserved for vendors. Uh, there's only, I think, one or two open for third-party sellers in Brazil right now. Uh, so again, the main focus is on the one P side in, in Brazil for Amazon. Uh, there's three options, like I said, vendor central, uh, DC from the U S which is what we've been talking about with, with NARF and, uh, well with NARF for Amazon or in, in country FBA, but we have the limitations there. Uh, you also need a tax ID. So no matter what, if you don't have a tax ID, you cannot use FBA in the country. So your only options are to be a vendor or to, uh, use the NARF program, to get the product in. The advertising in Amazon Brazil is extremely cheap uh, because there's not much competition from uh, foreign brands right now. Um, we've had clients that have started on Amazon in Brazil and have scaled quickly to doing $30,000, $40,000 a month with very limited advertising investment. The Brazil challenges uh, are many. <laughs> uh, Brazil has extreme protectionism. Uh, products shipped from the US have a minimum tax between 60 and 96.6% .6 of their imported value. And that's the imported value, including shipping costs. So that is a substantially high number <laughs> when you think about it, uh, which means there's gonna be a lot of cost for you when you bring the product in as well. There's a certain way you can deal with that to, to minimize it. Um, the country, uh, imported products can still have a price competitive, uh, well, pricing strategy compared to, to products that are manufactured in country because Brazil also has high local uh, taxes as well as manufacturing. There's, uh, I believe, five local taxes uh, for different manufacturers in Brazil, and that can potentially come up to about 60% of the actual price of the good. So when we're looking at competitiveness between importing and, uh, and manufacturing in Brazil, there's not that much difference. There's obviously more fees for imported products, but if your initial cost is lower, you can be pretty price competitive in Brazil with products that are manufactured locally. Uh, export processing zones or EPZs uh, can help you mitigate your importation costs. So the way an EPZ works is essentially that you bring the product into the country, you house it in the EPZ, and you only pay, pay taxes for the importation as you send each individual order. So instead of having to pay the upfront uh, costs of you know 60 to 90 percent of import value for 10,000 units, you only have to pay it one at a time as the order goes out. Uh, so it's not as much of a drain on cash flow. Any products over 50 uh, US dollars is going to have a minimum import duty of 50 percent. Uh, the IPI uh, plus import duty IPI is impuestos sobre productos industrializados. That's the manufacturing tax. Uh, and the import duty on top of that, based on the tariff schedule, the U.S. also does not have a free trade agreement with Brazil, which is another thing to consider. So you're going to have to pay tariffs no matter what. Um, you need to have a business entity to import the product that has the tax ID. So again, if you don't have a business in Brazil, you're not going to have the, you're not going to be able to import it yourself. You're either going to need to work with another partner to import it for you, uh, either on the logistics side or the warehousing or distribution side, I'd actually be able to get the product into Brazil. Um, the ownership has high upfront, uh, import costs. This is what I mentioned about the export processing zone. You can eliminate a lot of those costs by maintaining your inventory in an export processing zone, instead of having to pay all the costs up front. But if you're a distributor or whoever, whoever it may be in the country, uh, it could be your 3PL, for example, uh, is going to import all the product to their own warehouses outside of the, uh, EPZ. They're going to have to pay all those costs up front, which is going to be substantial. Uh, working with, and this is true in every case, working with local uh, freight and import brokers are going to help you navigate most of these challenges and give you the most accurate assessments. So if you're considering and going uh, your own into Mexico, Brazil, or any Latin American marketplace, I highly recommend uh, working with a local broker there to help you eliminate as many problems as possible. Last mile in Brazil is a lot different uh, as well, and it's highly fragmented, meaning that there's not as much of a developed highway system in Brazil to actually be able to import uh, products or to be able to ship products or last mile fulfillment within the country. 
So that is expected to grow substantially over the next 10 years. Uh, I think it's 10 years. The, the CAGR, uh, the count, compound annual growth rate is going to grow at 10.32% uh, over the next, I think maybe it's five years uh, period. Uh, domestic shipping routes are the main form of long haul within the country. So while in the US we have train routes, we have truck routes, highway routes, we even have uh, planes, long haul is typically done by boat in Brazil. So that has a substantial uh, time lag on it. If you're shipping products from one side of Brazil or from one end of Brazil to the other, uh, you know, similar to what we, we expect with sea freight from China to, to the US, it takes longer than air freight. It takes longer than other methods. So you're going to have that same problem with just local shipping or local distribution in Brazil. And that's going to take longer to get from one city to another city because it's going by sea. Um, <clears throat> Marketplace fulfillment is also limited from the FBA side. As I said, uh, Amazon fulfillment is largely uh, reserved for vendor central users at this point. Uh, when we made this deck, there was one uh, warehouse available to sellers using FBA. I think it's uh, two or three now, but I need to double check on that number. And uh, Mercado Full is available to all sellers that have a tax ID and get invited to the program. There's various 3PL services though that can help you with the last mile uh, delivery. Most don't have full country coverage though, because of a lot of the, the fragmentation in the market. So you may need to work with multiple L, uh, 3PLs or with a 3PL that's in an export processing zone to help you uh, deliver the product as fast as possible to, to all of these countries. Uh, with the EPZ, again, taxes are only paid when the product leaves the warehouse for delivery. Summing this all up. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I've been talking yeah, about One more quick question before you get into the summary. It's uh, yeah. going back to Mexico. Uh -huh. Somebody in the chat is asking uh, if we have any demographic profile information on the consumers that use Mercado Libre and Amazon in Mexico. Is there anything that you can speak to there in terms of who, you know, what shopping behaviors they have or demographic info they, they typically represent? I can't specifically go into a lot of demographic stuff. What I can say more is just about demographics in Mexico in general. Um, about 40% of Mexico specifically lives in poverty. So a good portion of the country uh, does not have access to banking. They don't have access to credit. Uh, they're pretty limited in what they can purchase. Uh, however, the other extreme, there are a lot of extremely wealthy and a lot of uh, upper class, a lot of middle class in Mexico. So from the consumer standpoint, the amount of income and the amount of money they have, they have a lot of disposable income. Uh, when it comes to shopping behaviors and shopping trends, I can tell you that the most uh, desired categories, and we know this because we're partnered with Mercado Libre, and they tell us what uh, products they're trying to get into Latin America, into Mexico, into Brazil, uh, are products like supplements, cosmetics, electronics. Electronics is the largest category or the largest demand uh, in Mexico and in Latin America in general. Uh, so if you fall into those categories, there is a uh, larger uh, opportunity for you to sell in a lot of these marketplaces because there is so much demand for it. Uh, but when it comes to individual shoppers, um, I can't give you too much detail. Another data point I can point to, though, is that the majority of household uh, buying decisions are made by females in Mexico uh, and in Latin America in general. So uh, from a demographic standpoint, that's another uh, point that you can have right there. Very helpful. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, no problem. And then finally, I'm just going to summarize everything because I, I went through a lot here. And then we can open it up to additional questions if we have them. Uh, when we look at e-commerce growth in 2022, USA grew 11%, Brazil grew 22%, Mexico grew 18%. Uh, when you are setting up a business in the US, it's easy, one to two weeks. Brazil, it's going to take at least eight months. Uh, my experience or what I've heard from other foreigners that takes closer to 12 months. I think in the index of ease of doing business, I think Brazil is something like 130 out of 185. So they're pretty far down the scale. Uh, whereas like countries like the US and uh, even Mexico are substantially higher on that scale in comparison to Brazil. Uh, to open a business in Mexico, you're looking at at least six plus months. Uh, and that really depends on your availability, uh, how, how much you're able to come down to Mexico or not. Um, taxes vary differently, uh, are very different in each of these marketplaces. Uh, sales tax in the U.S. ranges between 0 to 7.25%. Uh, VA tax in Mexico is 16%. Both of those are passed through. Uh, Mexico, you're going to have import tariffs as well. 
Brazil is the one that has the extremely high tax. Uh, your total taxes are going to be between 66% and 96.6%. Uh, that's going to be your import, your income taxes, your manufacturing taxes. Um, all of that's going to add up to a substantial tax burden in Brazil. But again, it is the largest marketplace. So if you're looking to get sales in Latin America, you kind of have to deal with that. Um, logistics wise, we have fast last mile and long haul delivery in the US um, and in Mexico, actually, uh, between highway networks and, and between the local uh, fulfillment networks in each major metropolitan region. Brazil, you have fragmented last mile delivery and long haul is done by boat. So it's gonna be slower than what you would see in the other two countries. Uh, that does make actually fulfilling orders in Brazil a little bit more challenging. Language differences, English, USA, uh, Portuguese in Brazil, Spanish in Mexico. Uh, and then finally, the marketplaces are even different between each country. So you're looking at Amazon and Walmart in the US is the two biggest, Mercado Libre and Lojas Americanas as the, as the two biggest in Brazil, and Mercado Libre and Amazon as the two biggest in Mexico. So what does this have to say? Or after seeing all of this, how should you approach this as, as a seller as getting into these marketplaces that are growing extremely fast? We always work, recommend working with local distribution partners. <laughs> it is by far the easiest route. If you have not been scared off by <laughs> all of the details I, I shared about opening a business in these countries, uh, you should be because it is really not a pleasant experience. It has a lot of headaches, a lot of brain damage that you really don't need to go through as a business owner. Uh, so working with local distribution partners is generally a better route to go. Uh, mistakes can be extremely costly when you're dealing with cross-border stuff. Like I mentioned, uh, the client that recently sent their inventory to us and then uh, had to send it back and then have to send it again because it wasn't done correctly. We had another client that sent by USPS, which I mentioned before. Uh, USPS ended up with Corrales de Mexico. The inventory disappeared. So now no one knows where it is. Um, making sure you're doing things correctly with service providers that can help you figure out the best way to get your product in, deal with all those challenges. Again, I highly recommend that. And then the other benefit of working with a local distribution partner or a partner that is already selling on a lot of these platforms like Mercado Libre, where reputation matters is that they already have the reputation built up. So you can get your products into Mercado Libre and start selling there. You don't, you're not starting from zero with your reputation on that platform you already have a basis point to, to go from. So uh, if you're interested in uh, you know trying to expand into Latin America, we would be glad to talk to you. Uh, this is what we do and help a lot of our brands with, uh, a lot of our clients' brands with. And we have a lot of experience dealing with some of these challenges and some of these headaches. So uh, if you'd like to, you can reach out to us at our websites, amzadvisors.com or goavance.com. Uh, my email directly is mike at amzadvisors.com or go advance is info at go, go advance.com or you can scan the, the uh, QR code here and you can get a little more information there. So uh, at that point, I think we have some questions. So I'm sure, I'm sure I've done a lot of talking. Hopefully I can explain the rest of these. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, this was very informative. Obviously you're, you're an expert when it comes to all things expanding to Latin America. So if you're listening today and you have questions, please reach out to Mike and get Get those questions answered about how you can expand into Brazil and Mexico for these opportunities. Mike, we do have one more question for you. Um, and if anybody else is listening and has questions, feel free to utilize the chat box or the Q&A within Zoom, and we'll go ahead and get those answered. Um, last question, Mike, How is uh, do you have a recommended process for finding a local distribution partner in Mexico or uh, maybe a list of partners that you would recommend? Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, we're glad to share that. Uh, it's probably easier to share it offline than it is to put it on here. But uh, if you're interested in finding that list, you can reach out to us and uh, we can make some recommendations there. Awesome. Yeah, I also shared Mike's LinkedIn and my LinkedIn as well. So if you uh, want to connect with us there, we're pretty active on LinkedIn and you can send us a message and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. If there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and end this uh, webinar today. Thank you again so much, Mike, for uh, joining and preparing this very detailed presentation. I think we all learned a lot today and uh, hope to see you soon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you again, Ryan.